the racer dons his helmet. Suddenly, there's no lonelier place in the world. It's been pretty tough in the last little while. Do I like to finish when I start? Otherwise, I'll, I might regret it someday. Today, the injured Hindle walks and mounts his Kawasaki only with difficulty. But he wouldn't be here at Shannonville if there was no chance of winning. I'd almost like to be known better as a, a fabricator than a racer. Most people know me as a racer, but really, you know, I'm a mechanic, fabricator. That's what I really like to do. I've been making uh, pipes uh, virtually since day one, since uh, Honda 7, actually I made pipes for Norton's. <laughs> back in the day, you know, and then the Rocket 3 came out and I made pipes for that. And a lot of pipes on the market were kind of just street pipes, not really racing pipes that were tucked up out of the way, you know, where you could drag the motor. <laughs> you know, you drag the pipe first. So, you know, a lot of times I had to make my own pipes out of necessity. You know, I'd make a few more, a couple more people wanted, uh, needed a pipe, so I I had a friend with a bender and, and he was bending the pipes and I was doing designing, but I was really so busy racing that I didn't pursue that uh, business side of it. And then when I retired, I pursued the pipe design. But another thing about making my own pipes, I had control on the lengths of them and, and I could just, as a rider, try a long head pipe or a short head pipe and take it for a ride and see which one I liked, you know, see what the stopwatch would say. At one point, I was racing a Rocket 3, probably 1970, and uh, I always, I couldn't get factory racing parts for it, you know, like high compression pistons and, uh, you know, cams and big carburetors and, and a frame for that matter. So I made my own frame. I took an eighth of an inch off the uh, the head and the, and the barrels to bring the compression up and uh, fitted uh, some large carburetors and, and redid all the linkage for the carburetors. And the bike I made a pipe for it. <laughs> uh, but the bike was really fast. Well, I, I guess it would be about 1973 that I was riding it. And it could, this Rocket 3, 750 Rocket 3, could outrun a Z1 up the straightaway at Mossport. So eventually I did get some uh, high compression pistons. Put them in. I had a dyno, so I tested it. I lost five horsepower. And I didn't like the feel of the engine just going, blipping the throttle on it. It just felt like, uh, it didn't feel as crisp as, you know, my setup, you know. I took them out and put it back the way it was. So when I went to the races like Mossport, uh, uh, some of the pros, I was a junior, some of the pros had these Rickman Triumphs, you know. And I could tell by listening to them that they had the high compression pistons in them. I, I'd say, so you got the racing pistons and that? Yeah, yeah, we got the racing pistons. Yeah. <laughs> So I, yeah, nice, and I knew, but I was a junior, you know, and I knew I could outrun them up the straightaway like theirs, you know. I had five horsepower on them, period. I was going for the Junior Unlimited Championship, and we were racing at San Aaron. There was a guy with a, a 1070 big bore Honda, and I'd been chasing him all year for the championship, you know. So this last race, I punched the motor out to 8, 867, and checked it on the dyno, I gained 12 horsepower. <laughs> so, oh man, this thing's crazy fast. I would motor up on him on the straightaway, and I'd go back off. <laughs> it's like he was, you know, a slow poke. <laughs> so I'd motor up on him, I never passed him. 
in, in practice, start of the race, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna take it in turn one. Uh, and I'm never gonna look back. Uh, and I got off the line, I just motored away and did a last breaking number, you know, nobody was in front of me. And uh, just went for it. And just about lapped the whole, well I did lap the whole field just about, you know. The guy on the Honda, I think he thought something was wrong with his bike. Because, <laughs> where did that guy go? You know, he's gone, I don't know. And then, basically, I traded that bike for a stock Z1 because I was turning pro. And I think I won my first pro race. Uh, my second race, I tried to outbreak everybody on the inside on turn one. Because, uh, you know, I'm starting to get aggressive, right? You, you kind of have to be. And I got my back wheel got hopping, and I had to run off the track. But unfortunately, I took three of the factory riders with me because <laughs> I was trying to outbreak them down the inside and all these other factory riders, uh, Ed Turgenica, uh, Mitchell and uh, Miles, I think, factory riders back in the day. Uh, they were all on the outside. I'm trying to go down the inside this new pro rider, right? And I ran them off all down the slip road. And when we got back to the pits, they were, they were all pretty upset at me all in different ways, you know. Ed Trigenica, for instance, kind of said, uh, you know, you shouldn't really do that, you know. <laughs> and the other guys, I'm gonna, you know, I'm never gonna race you again, you better not, you know. So, so I got thinking about it, I thought, you know, I still think I can do it, but the bike, the back wheel got hopping and uh, I, it wouldn't stop. So I ended up modifying the back brake and making special brake shoes for it. So when I used it, it would be nice and smooth. It wouldn't get hopping, you know. So I did that and uh, basically started winning, uh, winning races again because you know it was all in the learning curve. When things you believe you can do something, but maybe the bike can't do it, so rework the bike. I found set up on on bikes. You want to set them up so that the when you're banked over in the corner, uh, like fully banked, kind of racing style, knee on, knee on the ground or whatever you want to do it, call it, uh, that the mass is down as close to the ground as you can get it. So it's almost like you would set it up so the motor drags and then tweak the suspension up a little bit so it doesn't, you know? So that mass is down as low as you can get it without dragging. So, you know, when you're sitting upright, the bike might be high, but when it banks over, you know, it starts going down on the suspension, and that's when that all those dimensions are kind of critical, you know? You know, Kawasaki were the, the bike to beat, you know, right up into the 80s. 81, 82 was the last year I raced, and the Kawasaki was very competitive then, you know, it was the bike to beat, but it was a big super bike battle, you know. A lot of big names and all the manufacturers were in it. Well, they were kind of running a, what they call the Formula One class, which was the super bikes and TZs, you know. And the super bikes were competitive against the TZs, although the TZ was really a GP machine. And I think how I was beating them was intimidating them. You know, the, the Z1 is, at that time, more of a sit-up superbike, wider bars. And a, a lot of times on the slower corners, you could jump into the corner and kind of maybe, you know, wiggle and kind of out of shape a little bit and get it under control and blast out, you know? It wasn't the road race kind of smooth thing in like a GP racer, you know, just smooth. It was more like in quick, stop, turn and split. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of conflicted with the TZs trying to do that, do their nice road race corner. And I'd come in on the inside and, and then, you know, kind of sometimes once you get past somebody too, it's, 
they can't get back to their rhythm. You know, stuffing it in and getting past somebody has kind of a psychological effect on a, uh, a racer. I kind of think I'll sit in second and watch what goes on, you know. I'll just keep the push on. And, I mean, that's what I was doing that time. I don't know about this next race. It might be another story again, but that time I was just sitting there on fast cruise. Yeah, I think my bike setup uh, uh, was important, and, and being a rider and a mechanic and setting up my own bikes, although I had a lot of great help too, you know, some good uh, crew chiefs, you know. Uh, Dave Meyer, my crew chief, uh, through my championship years. You know, we had this communication thing going. I could try things on the bike and, and feel it as a rider and know I'd like some kind of change. Sometimes I do the wrong thing, but doing the wrong thing tells you something, that that's wrong, and then you go the other way, you know? So that's what you have to do uh, in setting up a bike. And one of the problems, a little bit of a problem, when you work inside a team trying to set up a bike, as a rider, you know, you might make a decision, okay, I think we gotta stiffen up the back spring. And then you go out and it doesn't work, your team kind of looks at you, well, what does he know? <laughs> so, you, you know, you have to be open to uh, make mistakes uh, and learn from them, you know. And sometimes the, the team environment doesn't let you do that as much as you would like from a rider standpoint, you know. But you got to listen to your crew guys too, and they all are trying to do setup too, so.